I tried to hustle the prison chaplain out of a dictionary, but a few weeks later, he surprised me with the Webster's Collegiate Dictionary. After I expressed my gratitude, the chaplain said, I know you put that book to good use, but use the Lord's book too. Shortly afterward, I asked the prison eye man for a thesaurus, which he provided. I tried Malcolm X's alphabetical technique for remembering words, which I found to be tedious. Instead, I randomly selected words from the dictionary, thesaurus, and other books. In spite of my former school teacher's assertion that I was ineducable, my intent was to memorize that entire dictionary. This was the early 1980s. The crip population was increasing, becoming a force to be reckoned with throughout the prison departments. Whenever I was escorted to the dentist's office in San Quentin or the walk-in clinic, I'd pass a large crowd of crips hanging out on the main line. It felt good to be recognized by other crips, whether they personally knew me or not. In spite of being handcuffed behind my back, I exhibited a posture of dignity and crip defiance. I was still only barely bursting through a violent drug haze, but remained a street folk hero on the wrong path, a purveyor of foolishness. San Quentin was hundreds of miles from where I used to stroll through South Central Los Angeles, bayou by the illustration of freedom. Years earlier, there was a Watt Stacks concert held at the Los Angeles Coliseum. Hundreds of Crips attended from West and East and some from Compton, prancing around, numerically strong, cocky, and seemingly invincible. I felt the illusion of being free that day, although there was a brief disruption. Big Country from the Brims Gang was stomped and beaten down the escalator for giving East Side Crip Styles a black eye. While some Crips were jacking other people for their drugs and money, someone hollered over the microphone, will the Crips please come down and clear the field of these troublemakers? When I looked up at Raymond, Bimbo, and Caesar, we burst into laughter. It was our homeboys down there who were creating the madness. Times such as that made me feel more invincible, more free, more in control of my destiny. A foolhardy, il a foolhardy illusion. Here I was now at San Quentin, freedomless, confined to death row, wondering if I looked as strange to some of these characters as they did to me. There was a Caucasian guy who thought he was a modern day vampire and avoided bright lights by wearing a blanket or sheet over his head. He was rumored to eat raw meat and drink blood, which was highly unlikely unless he would sell Anthropophagus, a cannibal. The would-be vampire was later found dead in his cell, supposedly by his own hands. The concept of suicide never registered in my life as an option, even during the worst of times. I never knew anyone who attempted or committed suicide. While in North Seg, I became acquainted with a few blacks, Blue, Peanut, Ed, X-Lax, Bedbug, Gangster, Milton, JP, Snow, Zoom, Little L, Mad Dog, PR, and Grandpa. Having given Mad Dog and Gangster their AKAs, I also gave Grandpa his moniker. He was an older black man, 6 feet 2 inches, muscular and agile enough to play basketball with any of us. Sometimes after driving iron, I kick back in a small group and listen while they engaged in a session of Bulology, braggadocio gossip on women, sex, money, drugs, and war stories. Being a private person and cautious, my conversation was limited. It was amusing to hear Grandpa launch into a political diatribe about death row being a racist slaughterhouse for society's blacks and other poverty-stricken people. He'd go on and on about governmental callousness, assassinations, tainted history, COINTELPRO, and the black struggle. Usually there was nothing comforting about what grandpa talked about, nor was it meant to be. Most of the conversations I heard went in one ear and out the other. My true interest lay in being vigilant and restricting my trust to a very few cohorts. At least once or twice a week I started experiencing bouts of claustrophobia and relapse. I feared into the abyss of psychotropic insanity. I felt I was losing my mind when the walls appeared to be closing in on me. Panic-stricken and drenched with sweat, I grabbed hold of the bars with a vice-like grip and tried to rip them apart to free myself. But regardless of my lifting massive weights and breaking handcuffs in the county jail, the bars refused to budge. For years, it was a silent battle to maintain my sanity. I found solace in driving iron, drawing portraits, reminiscing and doing whatever gobbled up the hours. Big Bub and Gigi had gotten their grade A and were placed on the tier beside me. To my dismay, Bub had lost a lot of weight after having a major operation. The doctor had to cut into his chest cavity to retrieve a malignant cancer, leaving a long scar. 
Bub was a shell of himself but managed to keep his predatory instinct intact. Though he could barely walk and limped with the cane, he installed fear in others and was active in chaos. Rumors began to circulate that crip intimidation and petty jacking were going on in North Say. Bub and his brother Gigi were the first to become suspects. They were charged with strong arming the guy for his tape player and tapes. Both of them were sent back to the hole. While sitting in my cell, drawing and minding my own business, Ed showed up with his face and lips turned ashy gray as if he had seen a ghost. There were visible streaks of blood on his t-shirt and he nervously said, cuz, those racist Aryan devils cut me with a razor. Gangster looked stunned. When the bars were racked open and I stepped out, Ed pointed at the culprits standing bunched together at the end of the tier. Looking in their direction, I bragged, oh yes, I can whip all of them and I don't want any help. Standing off to the side was a crowd of blacks, mostly Ed's homeboys. Gangster asked Ed, why didn't they help? He said, those ninjas were too scared to move. I crip strolled down the tier toward the large group of whites. I bumped into an inebriated white guy rumored to be their leader. With slurred speech, the guy said, watch where you're going, ninja. And when I turned around, he threw a jab that I avoided, then countered. While he was unconscious on the floor, I stooped down and used my fist as a hammer to bash his face in. A guard stood behind a fence, pointing a gun at my head. With each punch, I growled viciously and asked, is he out? The guard hollered, yes, Tookie, he's out, please stop. I don't want to shoot you. Though I intended to continue, another guard from the back of the tier started shooting and that caught my attention. Once back in the cell, I discovered my hand had a fractured bone protruding upward beneath the skin and was swollen. After having my hand x-rayed, the doctor put a cast on my hand and forearm that I later took off. The next day in the counselor's office, there was no mention of taking me to the hole. In fact, all he wanted to know was whether I was willing to squash the conflict. I responded, no problemo. I assumed the counselor expected the incident to escalate into a bloody racial war. After the unit lockdown, the white guy openly apologized. Privately, he thanked me, knowing I could have killed him in the name of self-defense. For a while, the unit operated as smoothly as a prison setting could run. But of course, we black folks tend to argue and fight amongst ourselves. As I recall, Grandpa and this fellow TJ, Troy Jones, started arguing over the weights, and TJ called him a homosexual. A fight quickly broke out, and TJ tried to flee the scene, but got trapped between the weight benches. His blood splattered on the wall and floor. It was reported that a knife was involved, so both of them were transferred to the hole. Though in his late 40s, Grandpa handled himself quite well. Maybe all the years he had spent in other California prisons had something to do with it. The prison system has a knack for eliciting the beast in man. 